Uh, so anyway, if you would, uh, if you haven't got a hold of me yet, just uh, let me know if you're going to be here and let me know how you want your steak cooked. That's <coughs> at 5.30, Wednesday, February the 19th. Uh, also after church today, we have the uh, Chocolate Fest uh, up here in the uh, Fellowship Hall. Uh, Wednesday at 5.30 this week, we're having our admin council meeting. Uh, and after that, let's see, Wednesday is a bell practice, right? Yes. Bell practice and choir practice on Tuesday. So 6.30 bell practice at 6.30 Wednesday. Uh, on February 16th, the youth will meet uh, at Magnet Cove. And that's at 5 o'clock. Uh, also in the bulletins, there is a, a schedule for the, uh, the Lent uh, services that's coming up. So uh, put that up somewhere where you can see it. Uh, February 23rd, we have the chili cook-off. Uh, following the uh, morning service and also on February 26th is the Ash Wednesday service and I'll be at uh, 5.30 that day. Uh, any other announcements? Chili cook-off rules are really simple. Bring your chili before service, put it in the in the kitchen so nobody knows who brought what and then I will have numbers and we'll bring them out and put them out there. We'll have little sampling cups for everybody to try all the different ones and if that's not enough with the sampling then uh, we'll also have bowls you can make a big bowl of whichever one you like the most so uh, the rules are really simple bring your favorite chili homemade chili and uh, if you'd like to make a soup I won't turn the soup down either so <laughs> any other announcements okay if you'll stand we'll do the call to worship Come and see, God's light is shining brightly. God's light shines in us. When we honor God's commandments, God's light shines in us. When we feed the hungry and give to those in need, God's light shines in us. When we show mercy and compassion, God's light shines in us. We are the light of the world. God's light shines in us. Amen.
assurance which come from Isaiah the 58th chapter. Even when we stray, God continues to guide us. Even when our souls become parched, God provides for us. Even when we call for help, God says, here I am. Praise God. Amen. And now it's time for our young folks to come forward for children's time.
commercial break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> technical difficulties.
Seele. So we come to our prayer time this morning. Do we have blessings to share today? I know this is a prayer request and a blessing as well. Uh, we're blessed that uh, Lynette was not injured any more than she was in her car accident this week. Although it was a pretty rough accident, she uh, is recovering and uh, she had several broken bones and ribs and things like that, but it could have been much worse. So uh, we say a blessing that she's doing okay, but prayers for her as well as she recovers. Do we have those we need to uplift extra special today? Gracie Goss. Gary Cooper. Gary Cooper. Mm -hmm. And pray for the Jim Stone family. Jim Stone family. Yeah, it's my daughter, cousin, Billy, and we'll see him out in Chattanooga, Tennessee. He's, he's been losing some of his vision. He's lost 40 pounds. He's discovered he's an extreme diabetic. <laughs> And he's having some problems. I like to remember him. So, uh, James is. Matthew, uh, Matthew Rayburn is his name. That's uh, James's son in law. So, uh, prayers for him as uh, he has found out that he is an uh, extremely bad man. The Alice Rogers. The Alice Rogers family. Other stuff with today. What was that? Yes, we have a lot of prayer. We have a lot of people on our prayer list. Remember those that are already there. Uh, lift them up in your prayers. And uh, also, if you have others to add during the week, just call us up. Anna's pretty good about getting those added to the bulletin. We also. Uh, I want us to begin praying and praying earnestly for annual conference, which will be in May. Uh, this is uh, really it's decision making time for, for our denomination. And uh, so uh, I want us to be in prayer that uh, the uh, leaders of our church will make decisions that will be not only better for us as a church, but also uh, pleasing to God as, uh, as they come together for this. So uh, be in prayer for our annual conference, which is in May. And uh, let God's will be done in whatever happens as they come together. Other stuff lift today. The Dodson and Brazil families? Yes, the Dodson and Brazil families, they are uh, friends of ours from our, one of our previous churches. Uh, Sean uh, found out that he needed a kidney replacement, and uh, they've been, they put out a message and they've been searching everywhere for one, and it ended up being uh, a member of that church that is actually their neighbor is... Uh, is a match for him, so uh, they're going to be scheduling surgery soon for that. So, a prayer for those two families. Other stuff left today. If not, then let us go together to the Lord in prayer. Our most precious and heavenly Father, this morning we come to you to say thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us. We thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for your strength in times when we need it most, and we thank you, Lord, for the promises that you give us. We thank you, Lord, for your healing touch. And we thank you, Lord, that even when we forget all the blessings that you give us, you continue to add to those blessings. We thank you, Lord, for this church, and we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together to worship you. We thank you, Lord, for those who fight to keep freedoms for us. And we thank you, Lord, for those who put their lives on the line for us every day. Firefighters, police officers, EMTs, our first responders. We thank you for their families. 
We thank you, Lord, for all that you are, for every blessing that you give us and that you continue to give us. Father, we take this time to pray for those who were lifted up this morning. Lord, we have a very long list on our prayer list. We pray for each and every one of them that their needs may be met, whatever those needs are. And Father, be with those who are being lifted silently to you right now. Father, give comfort where comfort is needed. Give healing where healing is needed. Give peace where peace is needed. And give strength where strength is needed. And we pray for those that we were thankful for just a moment ago. Our firefighters, first responders, EMTs. <coughs> those that continue to put their lives on the line for us. We pray for their families as well. We pray, Lord, for our denomination, for this United Methodist Church. Many of us have grown up in this denomination. And many of us have heard about all the things that are going on, the struggles that are happening. We pray, Lord, that your will will be done in this conference that is to come. And we pray that when this is all over, we will be able to unite as one together again and continue to make disciples for you. We pray for those who are in mourning right now. Lord, we pray for those who have illnesses that we don't even know about. And we pray for those, Lord, who are keeping secrets that might hurt them. Lord, you know our needs better than we do. Meet us where we're at. Guide our hearts. Guide our minds. Guide our spirits. And guide our actions that we may glorify you in all that we do. And Father, we thank you for all that you are and for all that you do. As we come together now to pray the prayer that you gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to try an experiment today, so y'all play along with me. I'm going to let y'all sit down for this song, but I'm going to need y'all to sing really well anyway, even though you're seated. So it depends on how well y'all do with the singing, whether y'all get to continue sitting during this song, okay? So let us sing together, sweet, sweet spirit.
in the same way that your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, nor the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I know we've been talking about promises for the last few weeks. In fact, this is the, uh, the third in the sermon series on promises. And we've talked first of all about the promises in Isaiah that, that God gave to Isaiah at that time and that were again repeated in Paul in the Corinthians as he talked about togetherness and bringing us together to enjoy those promises. And then last week we started looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And we heard that Jesus promised the kingdom to the weak, to the meek, to the poor in spirit, to those who fought for righteousness' sake, to those who turned for peace. And so today, we're looking at a part of the Sermon on the Mount that doesn't really first jump out at you and say, oh, there's a whole bunch of good promises in this scripture. There's some things that you have to look at to find the depth of the promises that Jesus is making here. We look at God's commandments, being merciful, being righteous, being compassionate. And so when we start looking at this, we wonder, where were the promises at? Where are the promises in this scripture at? But it begins right off. It says, you are the salt of the earth. What a wonderful thing to hear from Jesus. We are the salt of the earth. Now what does that term usually mean for us nowadays, right? When you talk about being the salt of the earth, right? We talk about, oh man, my neighbor down the street, he's a wonderful fellow. He's the salt of the earth. It's kind of a pat on the back. It's to make you feel better. Jesus is saying that we are the salt of the earth. Think about that for a minute. Salt. How important is salt to our daily lives? What could we do if we didn't have it? He talks about promises and he calls us the salt of the earth. Now, salt is not that expensive nowadays, right? You can go down to food center, you can buy a box of salt for about 49, maybe 50 cents for one of those decent sized boxes. But in Jesus' time, salt was an important commodity. It was not always easy to get. And so having salt was very great. It had a pretty good price tag on it. In fact, they bartered with it quite a bit. Salt could be given in, in, uh, for maybe some other needs that you had. So salt was very important. And Jesus is telling these people and telling us, we are the salt of the earth. Think about how valuable salt is to us today. Anybody watch those cooking shows that are on TV? I watch quite a bit of it. Lindsay got me started on these things, and now I'm kind of hooked to them. We watch these uh, Worst Cook in America shows, and then uh, what's Chopped or Kitchen Impossible or any of those things. Salt is important, right? What do they say if they do a bad job of salting? If you undersalt something, what do you hear? Ooh, that's terrible. Why did you make this awful food? Why didn't you put more salt in it? Did you taste it even before you gave it to me? These judges are pretty harsh on some of those shows. And if you oversalt things, you hear the opposite reaction. Oh my gosh, I need some water. I'm thirsty. Give me some water. It's too salty. You've ruined my food by oversalting it. So undersalting something is terribly important, but oversalting it can be just important. Look at what Jesus says. He says, salt is valuable. But what good is salt if it sits in that box and never gets pulled down, right? What good is salt if we don't use it? 
What happens to salt eventually? If it sits in your cabinet for three or four months or even a little bit longer than that, first thing you know, it's got moisture in it, right? It's starting to build moisture up and it gets kind of clumpy and then you start to pour it out and you put it on your food and you're like, oh my gosh, this isn't working very good. The salt is ruined. Jesus says that salt becomes worthless if it loses its taste. So as Christians... We are a valuable commodity. We are very, very important. But only if we take advantage of the opportunities that we have to spice up the earth a little bit by spreading God's message of love, of peace, of joy, and how wonderful being a child of God really is. So then what does Jesus say next? He says, not only are we the salt of the earth, but... You're the light to the world. Not only are we valuable as a seasoning, but also we're valuable as light. How important is light to everything that we do? It's so important that without it, plants wouldn't grow, right? They wouldn't get the chlorophyll that they need in order to build up and to produce more plants, and the greenery would be, good, would be gone. We wouldn't have any food hardly to eat. And we wouldn't be able to see anything either. We wouldn't be able to go hunting for food because we wouldn't be able to see. So light is very, very important. In fact, it's so important that twice a year we have a time change that helps us to save light. It's kind of outdated if you ask me. I'm kind of tired of it. I wish it would go away, especially this one that's coming up where we lose an hour of sleep. I, I, I don't really care for that one. It's outdated and it was all about farmers anyway. We have lights now we can put on our tractors, so... As far as I'm concerned, that one could go away. But that's just me grumbling because I like my extra hour of sleep that I'm about to lose. So that has nothing at all to do with Jesus' time at all. But when he calls us out and says that we are the light of the world, we're important. Look at what else he says. He says, a city on a hill shines brightly. You guys ever been kind of up in the mountains a little bit? And uh, in the distance, you see a whole bunch of lights, and you can kind of see the towns that are around and below, and how beautiful and well lit up they are. And you look ahead, and all the glowing of the lights that are coming. Well, if you're tired, if you've been driving for a very long time, and you see lights in the distance, you see a city coming up, the first thing you're thinking is, oh, great, a place for me to stop and rest for a little while, a refuge, a place where we have a bed to rest for the night. The same thing happened in Jesus' day. If people were out traveling and it started to get dusky dark, well, when they were run out of light, they might have had some lamps or something that might carry them for a little bit, but they needed to find their way to a town for real protection, for real peace of mind, for somewhere where they could stay. And so light was often important, and seeing that light in the distance meant that these travelers were close to finding a place to take a rest. And then he says, what else do you do with light? When you light a candle, you don't put it under a bushel basket, right? First of all, because you might catch your house on fire, because you put them under a bushel basket and a candle, it might eventually light that peach basket or whatever you used up. But also because if you put it under something, light becomes worthless, right? If you put a shade over it or you put something over it that covers it, it doesn't do you any good. Your light is a goner. So we let our light shine in the darkness. We let others see God's love and God's light shining through us, and then we give glory to God. That's an awesome opportunity. That's an awesome promise that He's given us in these two short verses. We are the salt of the earth. That's wonderful news. We are the light of the world. That's even better news. Because we are important. We mean something. We have a value. But we only have that value if we're willing to use it. Salt's worthless if it stays in the box. Light's not going to do you any good if you cover it up. So we have value, but only if we take action. Only if we do things. And then Jesus says something that probably shocked several of the people that were there at that particular time. He says, I did not come here to abolish or destroy the law. I came here to fulfill it. And then he goes even further. He says, not a letter on the law will be changed. Nothing will be any different until all is accomplished. 
Now there are those out there who think that that is uh, referring to his death and then his resurrection. And I think that's a pretty good point because if you hear Paul talking, he talks about how the laws were kind of holding the people down, how they had overpowered the people. <clears throat> think about law for just a minute. Here in this last verse, he starts to refer to righteousness being greater than scribes and Pharisees. Think about law for just a minute. See, the law that God first gave was good. These people had come out of the desert. They didn't know any better out of Egypt. They had fled. They had been slaves for so long. And God started to give them rules. Things that they would follow that would make their lives better. Don't kill each other. Don't steal from each other. Don't commit adultery. Listen to what I have to say because I'm your God. And then he starts to lay down rules for how to till the earth. Every seven years you have to give the year a rest. He starts to do things that can make these people's lives better. But see what happens over time is the law starts to get humanized, right? And so we add things that really aren't that big of a deal. We start talking about adding taxes to it. Or then we start talking about adding extra tithe to it. Or then we start talking about rules that kind of control the people. That keep the poor from gaining any real control over things. I watched the debates the other night and everybody seemed to talk about, well, this rule does this, or this law does this, or this keeps this, keeps this population base down. Well, that's what was happening in Jesus' time right there. The laws had become so restrictive that the poor couldn't keep up with them. So they'd get thrown in jail, they'd spend all their money trying to pay taxes, and they wouldn't get to live free. So, human righteousness is not always Jesus' righteousness. In fact, he probably scared people because he said, unless you have more righteousness than these of the scribes and the Pharisees, you're not going to get into heaven. Man, that's scary to think about. You, unless you're more righteous than the people that are supposed to be the most law-abiding and righteous of all, you're not getting into heaven. But Jesus was talking about a different kind of righteousness. Law following righteousness is not always Jesus following righteousness. Scribes and Pharisees, they were law people. They followed the law to a T. In fact, they were quite happy about that too. They'd go out and they'd brag about it. Oh, I follow every single law. Let me pray that I'll be not like these other people who don't follow the law as much as I do. They had gotten self-righteous. And it had overcome their ability to take care of those who needed care. Those who weren't able to feed themselves. Those who didn't have shelter. Those who were homeless. Those who were fighting for every little bit that they could possibly get. See, when God first gave us these laws, there were laws in there for hospitality. For taking care of the weary traveler. There were laws in there for taking care of the poor. The people who couldn't, couldn't eat on their own. It even said... Don't pluck all your vineyards. Leave some for those who are poor, the, the alien in your land, the birds. But those laws had gone by the wayside and had been replaced by human laws and by human greed. So Jesus says, whoever breaks these laws and teaches others to do the same, they'll be called last in the kingdom. And then he says, those who have a positive influence, those who teach the law, those who follow the laws, they get to be called greatest in the kingdom. So we have these promises right here in front of us. And they're pretty simple promises, really. They say, be the salt of the earth. Pour yourself out. Don't hold it all in. Be the light of the world. And don't put yourself under a bushel basket and hide Show your righteousness every chance you get. And glorify God by doing that. Can you not feel how important we as Christians are today to a world that is lost? Can you not feel what Jesus is asking of us? He's asking us to pour ourselves out. To glorify Him through our actions and through our words every day. And then the best promise is that if we do that, we get to be called greatest in the kingdom of God. So be the salt of the earth. Pour yourself out. Be the light of the world. And don't hide that light. 
let it shine wherever you go. Glorify our Lord. And then you get to be called greatest in the kingdom. Think about that. Salt and light. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our most precious and heavenly Father, we come to you today to thank you. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the promises that you've given us. And we ask, Lord, that you will guide us as we pour ourselves out to be the salt. And we ask, Lord, that you will guide us as we come out from under the covers to be the light of this world. Lead us, Lord. Fill us always with your love and your Holy Spirit. For it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Let us stand together as we sing our closing hymn, Standing on the Promises.